Welcome to the Friday Superstar Interview. Back to you, Tim. Good morning, everyone. This is Tim Harris, and of course, you just heard from Julie, and this is the Harris Real Estate University Friday Superstar Interview. So in case any of you are listening for the first time, which there's probably a few of you, what the Superstar Interview is, is Harris Real Estate University's opportunity to give back to the real estate community. So on these interviews, what we do is we provide you one of three things, and sometimes one of our uh, guests actually is magically able to provide all three. But sometimes we'll interview a top producing agent. That's what we're doing today with Mr. Joe Jackson from Columbus, Ohio. Other times what we'll do is we'll interview a famous author or maybe an upcoming potentially famous author. And the other thing we like to do in these superstar interviews is, of course, we like to interview economists and people from, you know, like, for example, we'll interview Sean O'Toole from Foreclosure Radar or we'll interview somebody who's going to be maybe someone you've seen in the news, somebody who's going to have be an influencer in the real estate space. But today, like I said, we have a very special interview with Joe Jackson from Keller Williams in Columbus, Ohio. So, Joe, welcome to the call. Good, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're at. That's right, exactly. And so, Joe, let them know where you sell. Give them a little bit of bio information on you and how they can get a hold of you. Sure, sure. Um, I'm in central Ohio, which is the greater Columbus area, right in the middle of the state capital. Uh, basically, I've been a licensed realtor since 1979. Uh, and I service basically the northern part of the metropolitan area, which is a little over $1.3 million, 1 million people, excuse me. Uh, my best contact is by email, which is rjoe, rjoe at kw.com. Uh, direct line is 614-431-1220. Uh, my practice is kind of a hybrid while I do a fair amount of residential, I also do um, a great amount of multifamily, most of it around the Ohio State University communities or in the community to the north. I also specialize in some single-family investment properties, uh, finding good buys in the REO or short sell world for investors to purchase way below market, renovate, and rent, and we either turn in that case, the investor may actually do their own management or return management over. I'm not in the property management business. I know what I can do and what I don't do well, and that's not one of them. And uh, Joe's not just giving himself a nice pitch there. We actually personally use Joe and his team in Columbus when Julie and I are buying investment properties, and we can uh, we are living, breathing testimonials to the fact that Joe is Johnny on the spot with finding bargains. I hesitate, uh, hesitate to give you a plug in that way, Joe, because I don't want any competition. And by the way, you owe us another smoking deal. Where the heck is it? <laughs> we're working it, on it. it. <laughs> it it's, you know, it's, we're working on it. It'll be there. I've got my eyes on a few. They just need to drop a little bit more before we can, you know, go out there and Justify take a stab it. at it. All right. So, Joe, let's let's actually start by congratulating you because you recently had what I'm going to assume is the highest closing maybe even for residential and commercial in Columbus, Ohio, of a nearly $4 million multifamily. Uh, yeah, that's that's a fairly large closing. Uh, there are probably some commercial transactions dealing with businesses or some large land tracts that are larger, but it's it would definitely rate up there in one half of 1% of everything that closed this year. And, I, and is it a safe assumption to say that that was your largest closing personally ever? Uh, yeah, that was my largest closing. I had uh, a couple closings, 1.8, 1.5, 1.2 that were in the commercial realm, but that was my largest. And this was a very well-maintained apartment complex near the Ohio State University that I had marketed privately and then on the market on and off since um, about this time in 2009. So, Joe, let's tell them a little bit about Columbus, because we don't interview, as you know, that many people from the Midwest. And, and honestly, you know, it's funny. When Julie and I personally coach people from the Midwest, they are oftentimes our best coaching clients, because even though there was some price inflation, there was no bubble. And so what you have is realtors like yourself, Joe, who always have had to have a high level of skill in order to get the job done. You've always had to be frosty, as we like to say. You've never been able to be complacent, and the market's never just sold itself. Oh, yeah, there's been little peaks, I suppose, in areas like Clintonville, but for the most part, you've always had to work to get houses sold, unlike, say, folks in different parts of the country that during the bubble were, I mean, quite literally just taking orders. 
So what's Columbus, Ohio doing now? Describe to them what the market's like and, and you know, because it is actually suffering some depreciation. Yes. Uh, some of the areas, some of the higher-priced suburban areas are, you know, going down in value as much as 5 10% a year, and the market is incredibly soft, stagnant, and in some places non-existent. Um you know, all real estate local is local, and there are actually some neighborhoods and subdivisions that have held their own in the last three or four years. Maybe they've been flat or slightly increasing in value, but we've not seen a massive 40% wrap up in value and 40%, 50% drop off in value. It's interesting. In 2002, the average sale price was 140000 and $83, which is quite low in comparison to some of the students. The highest sold price was in 2006, and that was 179046 So you can see why there was an increase. There wasn't a huge increase. And then in 2009, the price went down to 154133 So you can see it's not a rapid up a mountain, down a mountain. It's kind of up a little hill, down a little hill. Uh, but right well, exactly. now there is some softness in some of the higher priced areas, and frankly, even the more popular areas, there is more inventory than I have seen in my 32 years of marketing real estate. So, I mean, here's the thing that's interesting about the Midwest guys, just to you know reinforce what Joe said. There is never some huge colossal, and again, there's going to be some exceptions, like Joe said, in certain neighborhoods. But there's been never some, there's never some sort of like crazy run up in values. But unfortunately, places like Columbus, Ohio, which have proven to be very stable long-term places to own real estate, good rentals, by the way, good area to own rentals. But what we've seen now is unfortunately some depreciation, especially in the more expensive, you know, upper end areas. I know, like our friend Sandy Rains, who's a Harris Real Estate University student and uh, superstar. I mean, she's selling in the most expensive area in Columbus, where I think her average sale price for a while was like eight hundred thousand. And I know that, you know, she's got a colossal amount of homes for sale right now, too. So what is your – Joe, in, in areas like Columbus, I know you speak to other, a lot of other Midwesterners in terms of agents. What do you foresee? What's going to happen? What's your kind of crystal ball tell you that's going to happen over the next, say, 12 to 24 months? I would say some of the more inner-city neighborhoods are going to continue their very strong – decline in value where 60 70 percent of all sales are distressed i've seen some things in you know the south end or the uh near northeast that are selling at 1985 levels as far as prices i've seen a lot of ten thousand dollar houses for sale and yeah i'm closing a few of them i'm closing one today with the client so those areas are, are going to be really tough you go a little bit out further in the range, further from the city in the mid suburbs, areas like Clintonville and Bexley, Grandview, they're holding their own and their values are being flat and will I think will be flat or slightly declining. I think when we get on the outer edges in the more suburban areas, there's still way too much product and you're gonna see a continuing uh decline of value in those areas. What's the greatest challenge right now to a market like Columbus, Ohio? The greatest, the challenge, greatest, challenge, is trying, to greatest challenge is trying to get buyers motivated to get off the fence and make an offer. I okay, think that's so our tell best, me more our, about I has challenge. Well, the buyers have an attitude of like, gee, I like this house. I think it's a good price. I think 250 is a realistic price for this home. However, there's 19 others in this neighborhood. I want to go look at a lot of those first. And if this one's still here in three weeks and their price is lowered by then, I may make an offer. The buyers have too many choices, so their motivation level a lot of times is – is 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 lower, and it, it's hard to really light a fire on them to move on it now because you know what? It could be priced less next month. So how do you motivate them, Joe? What are you what are you coaching your team to do? You know, I understand what you're saying, Mister Buyer, but you know, if you really like that house, and we come back three weeks from now and it's gone, are you okay with that? Just to, the, the regular scripts to use to. You know, you're going to be okay if you lose that home, and that way you'll truly find out how motivated that purchaser is or not. 
Uh, we're just adapting a philosophy of the more red signs we have out there, the better chance we've got calls. So we're listing as much inventory as possible as long as the sellers are realistic in their value. So we're on, you know, we're on massive listing tear. Well, I have to say we have to thank uh, the FHA and the Obama administration and really the Dodd-Frank bill for maybe creating some more motivators that the real estate community needs to be aware of. And I know you know about these things, Joe. But come, though this next point isn't necessarily relevant to uh, your particular uh, business, but uh, for the most part, guys, all of you are going to be uh, experiencing an interesting little challenge come September 1st as the FHA loan limits get lowered. Remember, it's a little over 90% of all loans being originated right now are through the FHA. And if you're dealing with homes that are in the upper limits of what the FHA loan limits are, what is, the up, what is it, like 419 in Columbus, Joe? It's not quite that high, and the loan limit decrease in Columbus is very moderate. So okay, I so don't Col- think it'll yeah. hurt us a great deal, but definitely in some areas it's going to hurt. Yeah, in areas like uh, California and things like that, it's going to go down by a hundred thousand dollars. So I mean, and then the other thing is, got and the other thing is, is come April first of two thousand and twelve, uh, unless something radical changes, which it does not appear to be going to change, we're going to be looking at most people being required to put twenty percent down. Don't argue with me about it, guys. Don't debate it. Do your own homework, because that is the bottom line. What the banks are saying is going to happen as a result. If uh, the qualified residential mortgage rules, so those would be great tools to use to, you know, hey, Mr. Buyer, guess what? If you wait, you know, sure the house might be a little bit lower, but did you realize you're going to have to put down more money? Do your homework first, know the facts, educate your buyer, and that indeed might actually get them off the fence. So we yeah. talked about the important. We talked about the importance of having not just a few more listings, Joe, but frankly, a massive listing inventory. Why? You know, whoever controls the listing eventually controls the market as long as you're in a position where these listings are in locations that are acceptable and they're priced at or slightly below uh, the average sales price in the neighborhood because buyers are out there and you will still find if you've got a, a listing in a popular area and it's pretty and it's staged right and it's priced slightly below the market, the buyers will come. The buyers are simply waiting for the best value out there. So the buyers That's will right. come, but if everything is selling at 250 and you take another house and you take it out there at 251, you'll get a little flurry of activity. But if you can just say to that seller, what would you do if you had 240? And they, most of them will say, I'd take it. I go, well, let's not play games at 251. Let's just go out there at 240 and maybe we'll create multiple offers and you'll get 243 and you'll sell before everybody else. So it's just motivating people to price their property correctly and getting as many of those listings as you can. Give us an idea of what types of sellers you won't list houses for. And literally, Joe, do you tell them, I'm sorry, I can't work with you? Oh, yes, yes. I I had a seller recently that was behind the mortgage. It was a short sale and continued to debate my valuation of the property. And so when I went back for the second time to fill out the paperwork and looked at it and she goes, well, my neighbor says your price is too low. And I said, I think you're going to ask your neighbor to sell the house. And I just, I just gave her back the paperwork. Anybody who's in a short sale situation behind on payments, I mean, they have to be highly motivated to get their house price right now so it can sold. And this was in a neighborhood that had way too much inventory to begin with. So why do we need another overpriced short sale on the market that's just a time vampire and would just suck time and money away from your bottom line and from your team's effort? So I won't work with someone like that. I will not work with a seller who treats me like I'm their employee because I'm an independent contractor and a business person. I don't get paid till I close. I'm not your employee. And I fired a longtime REO client just this week because of that. I said, okay. I just won't work with an unrealistic seller who doesn't respect my opinion and my knowledge of the market. What's the number of listings, Joe, that you target to have? Do you have a specific number? or do you I like to always have 50 or more. Okay, 50 or more. Like so what, or what are more. your What are your – so let's say, for example, it's August, and you don't have your, you know, predetermined 50 listings, the number of listings that you require or at least you feel comfortable with. And you had to generate inventory fast. You with me on this? Yep. What would you do? What would you do? 
I would get on the general. phone. Good. I would get yep. on the phone and call people, my my inner core who have and will and give me referrals, and I would just simply you know go into my you know hey I'm getting real busy you know, and I'm preparing to get real busy, but I still got time to handle one or two more sellers. Who do you know or who do you know who would know somebody who may want to get their house sold in the next house or investment property sold in the next couple months, and just make massive amounts of phone calls, and I beat the streets, and I start going for sale by owners and seeing if they're going to have an open house and just say, hey, I market in this neighborhood. I'd like to see every house that's on the market, even if every house that's for sale, even if it's not on your market, can I come look at your house? And I'll just start working for sale by owners. I think most agents are afraid of for sale by owners. Why well, I don't specialize them, I'll list a half dozen a year if I go after it, if I want it. That's how I would generate. That would be the two ways I'd generate some more inventory. Well, so, Joe, what I heard you say is that you would do things proactively. You would Absolutely. not just basically – you wouldn't just run an ad or you wouldn't just do a mailer or you wouldn't do anything else other than literally put yourself in front of customers, Correct. That's correct. It's it's belly to belly. It's face to face. If you can get face to face or at least on the phone, you've got a shot at it. Uh, while I do do some direct marketing in 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 areas that I sell a lot of property, I still do a little bit of direct mail. Um, you know, I just think getting right back to people face to face is the best way to take care of it. So. Joe, you own part of the Keller Williams office, a really great office owned by some other really fantastic broker owners. Um, and so you have a lot of agents in your office. I'm sure some of them, well, I'm, I doubt if they have very many of them at all have your level of experience. How often do you see new agents in your Keller Williams office actually willing to be proactive about going after business versus basically doing everything passively? Occasionally, you'll get someone coming in new who has a sales mentality and is hungry and will do it, but most of them are coming out of real estate school where they just teach you how to pass the test, and they just think somebody's going to give you some business, and it's not going to happen. And So I would I would say less than 10% of the new agents coming in get it and realize they got to go chase it. Joe, are those the same 10% that make it after 24 months, the ones that are willing to go get it and chase it? The, the majority of the ones who, who stay with it for 24 months are in that 10%. The 90% yep. who just won't chase it, you know, I, I would doubt if 1% of them would be in business in two years. I mean, we've so all guys, seen the it, revolving it, door. It's a mindset. We talked about it this week on the Daily Motivational Messages when we were talking about urgency. Now, urgency is something that, a lot of people think they understand and may even convince themselves that they participate in sort of an urgent manner of uh, conducting business that very few do. I, having uh, sold real estate, Jules and I sold real estate in the same market as Joe, I promise you, Joe knows urgency. Joe, what does urgency mean to you when it comes to buyer leads? When it comes to buyer leads, I mean, you've got to get back with them. If they're hitting you on, if they're hitting you on your website, if you don't get back with them in five or ten minutes or less, they're going to be on someone else's website. You got to set up a drip system where you got to drip on them for a week, and if they give you a phone number, you have to call and text them three times within a week. You've got to. There's not that many ready, willing, and able buyers, and it's a huge funnel. But I spent the money to get the buyer in your funnel. You better go after it. And so my staff does a. One of my staff does an excellent job on that. Another one does good, and the other one's too passive, which is why he'll only close 20 houses this year. So when it comes to listings, like so you get a seller lead, how long how long does it take for you to follow up with that seller lead? Uh, that seller lead is generally followed up. You know, if it's a call, of course, you know, we have an intake form, and if I'm not here, my staff takes care of it. If it's me, I get an intake form, and I try to get a pre-listing packet down to them within four hours or less. And I'll basically run a very tight CMA using a Terrasoft tight titan program which very few people use and my basic pre-listing kit which is nothing fancy but it's there and i'll have it delivered down in a ups envelope and announcing uh i'll be over here to see you you know at, at nine o'clock saturday morning to, to take a look at your home and i find that gets the, that's a wow factor that most people don't do yet it's been you know it's been taught a lot of conferences just be there and be there first and be be good at it, 
and make a good impression on the client. I mean, I literally had two call in this week, and they both got pre-listing packets within two or three hours, and they were both pretty wild by it. Well, I mean, that gets back to urgency, right? I mean, that's really the bottom line, guys. And, and Joe, is, you said something. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, this is the most important financial transaction of most of these people lie, is life. So, you know, if you're there and you're on top of it right away, that just wows them and shows them that you, you know, that you really do care and you want to get the job done for them. So, Joe, if you aren't urgent and, you know, you're speaking to hundreds and as in, they listen to and replay thousands of realtors, right, and these interviews live forever on the Internet, if you're speaking to a mass of agents right now, which you are, and they don't understand, like, their importance of urgency, help me to explain to them what impression they're leaving with potential buyers and sellers when they're not urgent. What does that tell that potential client? If you're not urgent on the initial contact, how urgent are you going to be when my transaction's in trouble? How urgent will you be when we have an inspection issue and a deadline? How are you going to take care of business if you're not urgent? That's what it tells the client. Do you really care? Yeah, that's it. I mean, there's no negative attributes whatsoever that they'll assign to you if you're urgent, that's the thing. And sometimes, Joe, we speak with agents, I'm sure you see it in your office, where they'll say, like, well, I don't want to seem too pushy, or, you know, I don't want to come off as a salesperson. You are a salesperson. Read your license. They have all these, they have all these preconceived notions about what they don't want to be, and they have this long list of what, how they're afraid to be perceived. But what they really don't realize is by not being urgent, by not being a salesperson, by not knowing the market, by not really being uh, a professional, they're not being perceived as anything other than a broke agent. I mean, that's really the bottom line. So, Joe, we've had some questions about marketing and lead generation. It's always, as you know, I'm sure, a favorite question of agents because agents believe that lead generation is their biggest challenge where it's not in all reality. Their biggest challenge is knowing how to qualify leads, which we're going to talk about after that. So, Joe, we mentioned the fact that you will prospect, essentially, over the phone, OTP prospect for FISBOs, for your centers of influence and your past clients. What other things do you do to generate business? To do, you know, when I get a new listing, to go and do a little door knocking right around that listing, especially if I've got to have an open house that Sunday, just to meet the people. Uh, and I will occasionally do an open house in a good location where I can get a lot of traffic just to percolate in people's mind that I'm out there in business. I mean, I realize that, that the opportunity of selling that open house at that open house is slim and none, but I want to meet people, and I want to meet massive amounts of people in a short time period so they know I'm, I'm in and still in the real estate business. An example, I got a call to list a house in the Clintonville area this week, and I go, well, how'd you find out about me? He goes, oh, we came to one of your open houses a year ago, and we just thought you were real nice and knowledgeable, and so you were the one we were going to call when we need to sell our parents' home. I don't remember these people at all, but they knew me, and it's not who you know, it's who knows you. And so just to be out there and real well-known helps me, you know, in, in prospecting and getting more leads. But, Joe, you're, in a way, you're not giving yourself enough credit because it's not just being well-known. It's being well-known as somebody who's an expert. It's being well-known as someone who actually knows what they're talking about. So you, you could have just been in that open house and been the nicest guy they ever met, but if you weren't knowledgeable, they probably would have lost your business card. Well, that, that's true. That's true. Uh, product knowledge is, is critical and that's where I'll go on my multi-family side where I sell a lot of apartments around the Ohio State University area. And frankly, there's a dozen groups, plus or minus, who control 80% of the market. And I know them all, and they all know me. And I'll do rent surveys with them in the fall. Hey, how is your rent up going for next year? You know, what's hot, what's not? You're getting any rent increases, I'll tell them. I go, I'm going to collect this information and share it with the group. I'm not going to say Tom said this or David said this, but I want everybody to have a pulse on what's going on in the market. And they all appreciate it. And, you know, two-thirds of them have used me and referred me business in the past and will in the future. So having a good knowledge of that marketplace has been very helpful. Um, so, guys, go ahead and enter your questions in. I'm going to ask Joe about his pre-call scripts, his pre-listing pack. 
Um, a lot of you guys are asking questions along those lines. So, Joe, let's jump right in. You mentioned that when a buyer or seller calls into your office or communicates with you through any, you know, any spoke that you may have created, they have to answer a series of questions. Can you walk me through my experience if I call you up today looking to purchase a home? Uh, to purchase a home, uh, and a lot of times I take those calls to my buyer's agents, but, you know, it's really kind of simple. I want to engage them in conversations with open-ended questions. So, hey, Tim, that's great. Where did you see that house was for sale? Did you see driving by it or did you see it online? You know, just then I listen, you know. Well, what about that property interested you or made you call? You know, where is their focus? What type of house do they want? Do you currently own a home or are you currently renting? And then, well, okay, I'm so renting, you, use, you know. You use I've a got script, a script though, right though, here. Sure it's on have... my bulletin board. Yeah. Okay, good. You're, re- you're literally looking at it. So, guys, here, here, I'm sure you have a similar script for a potential seller, correct? Correct. Yeah. So, guys, Should here's the moral through? of the story. Yeah, go ahead. Let's go through it. Hello, I'm interested yeah. in selling my house. Oh, that's great. And can I have your name again? I didn't catch that. No you problem. Know, get the Tim name. Harris. Okay, and, and what address are you are, are you currently at? And is that the address of the property you want to sell? Uh, yes. And here's okay. the address. Okay. Okay. Are you the sole owner of the home? Sole owner of the home, or is there another owner? Uh, me and my wife. Okay, that's great. And her name is Julie. Okay. Okay. Super. Now I need a little bit of information so I can best service you. Can you give me all your pertinent contact? What's the best phone to reach you at? What's the best email to reach you at? Do you prefer I call you, email you, or text you? Because you got to believe in the platinum rule, folks. You treat people the way they want to be treated. So I want to know how they want to be contacted. Then I go, Why are you selling? Okay. So we are we. Go well, ahead. so Joe, that's a re- that's a really important question. I don't want to go over that one too fast. The why are you selling question, in a lot of ways, guys, is more important than making sure you got all their their, their return uh, contact information because the why are you selling question really determines whether or not Joe's going to go forward. So let's Joe, let's go over the most what what you look for when you're looking for a seller because agents still in this market are listing houses with unmotivated sellers. So tell me the types of sellers you're going to look for and the types of sellers that you, frankly, maybe will counsel or refer off to another agent? Uh, I'm looking for sellers who are realistic in their expectations, who are not upside down on their homes in market areas that still have uh, consumer interest. You know, so if you owe 150 and the market's 130, I'm, you know, I gotta, I gotta want it real bad to take it because doing short sales, even though I've had training like what Tim and Julie offers, it's still very, very, very brutal. So I'm looking at a house that's not upside down. The transaction may not be that difficult. I'm gonna look at somebody who is willing to listen to me and take my advice and that has an urgency to sell. We we need a bigger house for our family. I'm looking for a two-sided sale, if at all possible. You know, we need a bigger house for our family. We're relocating to Seattle. We got to be there in two months. So someone who's going to price it right, get it pretty, so when the buyers come through, it's going to sell. And by the way, brutal compared to a conventional sale. But if your choice is short sale or no listing at all, you list the short sale. Joe has the luxury. Yeah, exactly. Well, Joe, we have to preface this because there's a lot of people that look for little tiny things, especially when they're hearing influencers like you and they attach everything to it. So we have to bet, we have to really do a good job of being very clear on these calls. Joe's been in the business since 79, okay? He has lots of centers of influence and past clients and he's doing decent size and really nice size commercial transactions. He can be more picky. Agents listening now and listening in the future, you probably can't be. Let's just be honest, right? So list any motivated seller, short sale otherwise. List any motivated seller. And the beautiful thing, Joe, is as every day passes, it seems that short sales are getting easier. But what I'm hearing you tell me is that you are only listing sellers who are absolutely positively have to sell sellers. Will you list someone who says, well, Joe, we're just going to put it on the market to test it, test the price? Will you do that? Absolutely not. Okay, well, Joe, listen – Joe, we're just going to – oh, here's one I always used to love. This one's always fun, right? So we're thinking about downsizing, <laughs> right? That's Can you tell me what one. you mean about thinking about downsizing? Oh, there's a good question, right? 
So and here's and I'll, Joe, see Joe naturally goes to turning around, turning around whatever they say and asking a question like Joe. If someone calls you up and says they're looking for a really good deal, what do you say? Well, that's great. You know, I'm always on the market to I'm always out there looking for an opportunity for a really good deal. What do you define a really good deal at? You know, there what, you go. What, what areas you looking at? Well, so the re- Joe, why do you ask them? And let's kind of you know drill down on that point because it's so important. Because most agents, if someone says to them, I'm looking for a really good deal, they're just automatically going to assume it's price only. But what do you, like, when they say I'm looking for a really good deal, what are the different types of things that they might say? Uh, a lot of times it's price, but sometimes it's just looking, it's a it's a, a certain neighborhood that they really want to be in and they want to get at or below the market as far as the price. Um, House is in good condition. They can move right in. in a good deal might be right. Yep. Yeah, a good deal is different to everybody. It's not always a price issue. That's right. All right. So, Joe, you mentioned your pre-listing kit, um, and I like how you were humble about it and said it's not the fanciest ones because I know there's some certainly fancy ones that are floating around out there in the marketplace. But what is? Tell us what a pre-listing kit is, and believe it or not, people still don't know. And tell us uh, what is in yours. Okay, on the right side of my pre-listing kit, because it's an well, 8x11. Let's tell them what it is. Joe, let's tell them what it is, because we're making assumptions here that they actually know what it is. We're speaking okay. to agents all over the country. Okay. When, what is a pre-listing kit? When do you send it out? How do you send it out? Okay. Uh, the pre-listing kit I have is an 8x11 folder, the company folder, and it's two-sided. So you open it up. On the right side are all the forms they're going to have to sign. I'm assuming they're going to list the property with me, so I give them the listing contract, the, the state required disclosures, and our, our our company required disclosures. So that's the paperwork side. The right side is the the left side is the marketing side. And what I'll do there when I see a good article that comes out in the print, third party source, I'll put it out there. The Columbus Dispatch just had a article July 10th, 2011, the housing market, buyers practically home free these days, and it talks about how buyers are being very brutal on pricing and on inspection terms. So I didn't write the article. I just give it to them so they know where the market is. Then I'll put, give them a chart that I pull out of Realtor.com, and it'll show detailed reports, and it'll show a number of views of a sp- specific property, so they realize at that point that the marketing is 99% online, Internet-based. Then I'll give them examples of my number one expert site and what site it feeds into. Then we have the team mission statement. Uh, we have the chart that I spoke of earlier of area housing statistics. I have a meet the team sheet which got everybody on the team who's licensed, their phone numbers and email address and a little bit of biography. I've got some annual statistics from the multiple listing service which goes back all the way to 1955 to 2010. I have a little bit of information uh, describing centralized showing service so they know that I don't call them when their house is being set up. They get called from a showing service. I go over what a clue report is. I have a little bit of company information ranking the residential real estate agencies in central Ohio. I have some client recommendations. I've got a list of utility numbers, list of service providers, lenders, home inspections, attorneys, termite people. I have a list of the Jackson team contractors. Then any other thing I would see online that would make sense that's pertinent to getting a house sold, I'd put it in there. Then I have preparing your house for sale and showing your home. That's basically what I've got. All right, so you get that over to the sellers. You heard him say it, guys. You call Joe to list your house in uh, central Ohio, right, in Clintonville or wherever else he specializes in, which is mostly central Ohio. You want him to sell your house, you call him within two or three hours or less, you're going to get this package of information. That right there out of the gates is going to be impressive. Now, remember, you're getting that after Joe or someone from his staff, and he doesn't have a very big staff. Joe runs a very profit-sensitive business, which I appreciate. So what then is going to happen is you're going to get the pre-listing pack. Then that's going to be your secondary wow. Now, if you're just dealing with a traditional realtor who's going to go through the traditional process and not be organized and not be as professional, not be as systematic, you are going to absolutely positively stand out if you're doing business like Joe. 
Now, in his pre-listing pack, he said something at the very start. I hope all of you heard him say, this is something that Julie and I, and of course, Harrisville State University coaches all of our students to do. When you're sending over a pre-listing pack, act as if, act as if you already had the listing. Send the listing paperwork already along in the package. Joe, I am sure you have had the experience of showing up to the listing appointment and having the seller literally hand you the paperwork back. No sales presentation necessary. They've already decided to sell with you. I'm making an assumption there. Don't prove me wrong. <laughs> oh, that happens. That happens yeah. a lot. I mean, and then, you know, I've got people I've dealt with for years. They'll just call, you know, and they're more multifamily. Come on over. I want to list these properties with you. So there's no there's no sales involved. It's just to get it done. But when you're dealing with somebody new that doesn't that knows you but doesn't really know you but they know of you you have to present a strong point of difference between the other agents and i just think a pre-listing packet and it's been preached for years and years and years yet i would say 95 percent of the agents don't do it i just think it's the wow well, factor yeah well absolutely 95 percent of the agents don't do it and guys remember theme of this week's daily motivational messages and you can feel this vibrating from Joe. And he's been in the business since 1979, sold thousands of homes, right? And he's still frosty. He still has urgency. He gets it. And, guys, even if you're a brand-new realtor and you're urgent and you're frosty and you're doing things like what we're talking about, which is not take that much effort, being the first guy or gal there makes all the difference. There's a NAR stat that came out, and I don't remember the exact number, so – someone out there wants to send me the number in the webinar, that would be great. But it's close to 90% of the time a buyer or seller will choose to work with the first realtor they come in contact with. Mm -hmm. Think about mm -hmm. that. The first person that returns the phone call. The mm -hmm. first person that says, yes, I want the business. So being first, guys, being urgent, statistically trumps about everything else out there. Now, for the brand-new realtor whose license number isn't even dry on their license yet, right, the ink is still drying, you better remember that because that is key to success, especially because everybody is on the Internet nowadays, especially, as Joe said so brilliantly, people can just get your page and hop onto another. That urgency is so critical. That's everything. Joe, you mentioned some unique things to the Joe Jackson team, you know, what's been tra traditionally called um, – USPs, Unique Selling Propositions. Can you give us some other unique selling propositions that you're personally using if you had to like narrow it down to three to five reasons why someone should do business with you? And maybe some others you've seen in the marketplace that you admire that you're not particularly employing yet? Um, the unique selling propositions that we offer would be, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, this is really important transaction. I'll let you know, if I'm not in the office and I'm out with a seller with you, you, the phone calls coming in on your property are being forwarded automatically to a licensed agent. They don't have to wait for someone to get back with them on a call. Um, I, I try to stress the fact that, you know, you can hire the solo agent, and when they're out of town for a week, nobody covers your business like you. When you hire the Jackson team, you've got five licensed agents working with you. You know, this isn't anything unique. This is just team stuff. No, but it but, is But it is unique. I, I heard you say urgency. That was the first one. We're not going to uh -huh. delay getting back with potential leads. Okay, that was the first USP. We talked about uh, the fact that you have a team, so it, you have everyone's covering each other, opposed to being solely reliant on one realtor who might be taking the day off, and if they take the day off, their business closes, basically. So those are two vital USPs. Joe, they don't have to be new. But they, you know, because the older ones have a tendency to be actually the most powerful USPs. So, what are some other reasons why? I can think of Joe, frankly, a ton of reasons why someone would choose you over another realtor. But what are the other ones that you sort of, uh, you know, use when you're selling yourself and your staff? Well, if an example, and you've mentioned the Clintonville area quite a bit, and we we talk about web, and is this that unique? I don't know, but. You know, I, I go, you know, people, you know, just go ahead and Google Clintonville, Ohio homes and see whose page comes up first. That's where you want your house, isn't it, Mr. and Mrs. Seller? So good web, good good uh, SEO to market your property. Uh good. Why do you, Joe, why do you, why do you feel ultimately when they sign the listing contract with you? 
why is it that you think ultimately, like if you could only talk about one reason to choose you, right? You're, some seller gives you a one-minute listing presentation. You're competing against some other really fantastic agents. And believe me, guys, in Columbus, Ohio, some of the best realtors in the nation practice there because they have to be good because the market is consistently challenging. So you have a one-minute listing presentation. It's a sweet listing. It's the dream house, Walla Walla Ravine. You know, it's never been for sale before, <laughs> totally remodeled. You get the idea. All right. Yep. In that one-minute listing presentation, what are you going to say to that potential seller why they should list with you? Wow, that's a great question. Uh, again, I would stress the fact, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, when you hire the Jackson team, you're not hiring one agent. You're having, hiring five agents, and I will tell the world about your listing. I will network with all the other realtors in the Clintonville area. And I'll make sure it's on the top of their radar. And I'd like to have a special lunch with this Wednesday, 11 to 1, or next Wednesday, 12 to 2. Be better so I can get this all set up and get my staff in place and bring 30 of the top producing realtors in the Clintonville area to look at your fine home so we can help find a buyer who's going to love your home as much as yours. Joe, I appreciate that. And I'm going to I'm going to. Uh, some ex- personal experience I've had with you, Julie and I've had with you, is that you have talked us out of buying properties, right? You've talked sure. us out of buying properties that we were ready to write the check for. And you said, no, Tim and Julie, that's not the property for you. And I think that's something that so few agents out there would even conceive of doing is talking a potential cash buyer out of buying a house, right? So you have, a, you, you're, you're uh, I guess, confidence not only in yourself but in the marketplace makes it so that you are somebody that people can trust, unquestionably trust, I feel. So talk about the importance of ethics. What does that mean to you in the real estate business in today's market? Um, If I don't have ethics, I don't have a business, I can't really live with myself, you can be a functionary, an order taker, or a fiduciary. And as a fiduciary, you have to go to your client, whether a buyer or a seller. No, I don't think that's in your best interest to do that. And if they insist to do that from that point on, that's their choice. But in some of the houses you wanted to buy, you know, it wasn't that it wasn't a good house, but just the price was 10 15% out of line. And we needed to wait for the market to drop. Uh, a situation I had with a seller about a month ago is we had a really good offer come in right away, and we took it. We had three showings. Everybody who looked at the property liked it. Uh, the buyer number one came back and basically said, ask us for the sun, star, and the moon, or repairs. And I told my seller, we just need to let this person go. We're not even, you know, that's my obligation. Let this go. And, I, you know, I could have tried to work the transaction and maybe kept it together, but it wasn't in my client's best interest knowing that there were two other buyers out there. And lo and behold, within 48 hours, one of those other buyers came back and made an offer that was nearly as good. And when they did, did the inspection, they only asked for reasonable things that the seller was glad to do. This was a FISLO, by the way. And we're closing next next week. So nice. I, I, something I learned a long time ago, the guy told me it's better to miss a good deal than buy a bad deal. Because, you know, we've all bought bad deals before, whether it be a house or a car or we made a bad hire in our business and it's, instri- it's extremely costly and stressful to dig out from that. So I I don't want my clients buying bad deals. Joe, looking you know, that's, back. That's my obligation to them. Joe, looking back, when did you really feel like you could do it, be successful in real estate for the long term? You know, I cut my teeth in a really hard market, late 70s, early 80s, and it really took me a year and a half or two to get some confidence built up. I was fortunate enough that the first office I, I was in actually had a fair amount of younger folks who were involved in investment property. So I got to learn apartments as well as houses. So I got to deal with investors who are simply buying by the numbers, non-emotional. And that helped build my confidence because a good investor will buy a house on Christmas Eve. And it helped build my confidence that I can do this. 
where if I would have stuck strictly residential where it's more emotional, I would have I would have been successful, but the path for success came quicker when in nineteen eighty one rates were at eighteen percent. However, you had people who had money and you had people who desperately needed to sell their house. So I could work with cash buyers buying properties at a discount, and I just learned how to do the deal and do the deal and do the deal over and over again. Is this market that we're in now or maybe going into more challenging than that 70s market when interest rates were double-digit, Carter administration, all kinds of unemployment, you know, all these other things that people – you know, look back upon saying that was a bad, bad market. Statistically, this is a worse market in terms of depreciation. This is the worst market in the history of the United States, worse than the Great Depression. How Do you feel like it's worse than it was back in the 70s? In some ways, it's it's as worse or a little bit of worse, but, you know, in affecting me back then, I was new. I didn't know any difference. You know, that's 15% interest rate. Well, so what? We'll get a good buy on the house. Here's the payment. Can you afford it? Is this a worse market? For me, no, but I can see for a lot of, uh, you know, in a lot of areas or a lot of agents, it could be a worse market because values, I mean, when, when your value is 80 or 60% of what it was five years ago, that's tough for people to make a move. Right. That's I mean, every fortunate looking about being in central Ohio, we haven't seen huge declines overall. Except in the upper end, and you know when those uh, and the realtors upper go end and the bottom pre- end, right? And when realtors go on listing presentations in those particular market segments, it's almost like an intervention with the seller, you know. So uh, looking back, I mean, did you ever do you ever doubt that you could be successful as you are now? Do you remember having doubts as you progressed through the years, the many years? A lot of times in the early '80s when the calls weren't there and I wasn't trained to prospect enough, and I'd have like two listings and two buyers, and it's like, ugh. You know, what am I going to do here? But, um, you know, those doubts have been gone for, you know, 25, 27 years. I don't have any doubts now. So the doubts erase themselves, essentially, when you decide to take action and be proactive about your lead generation, when you decided you were going to be in control of what your business was going to do, opposed to the market controlling your business. Is that what I just heard you say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, the the thing of it is – you know, if, you, and if, you, if listeners, if you heard this story, I'm sorry, but somebody hasn't. You know, somebody asked Wayne Gretzky, <laughs> the greatest hockey player, you know, Wayne, how are you so great? You always go where the puck is? And then Wayne goes, no. I go to where the puck, I think the puck's going to be. You know, so realtors, you go where the puck is or you go where the puck's going to be, most realtors wait for someone to hit them, hit them the puck. <laughs> or hit, you know, hit the, have the puck hit him in the head. Yeah, I mean, now if you go where the puck is, you'll get some business. But if you go where the puck is going to be, if you can figure out this is where the market's going to be, I mean, you've got so many realtors says, I don't want to do REOs. I don't want to do short sales. Well, in some areas, that's 60% of the market. You might as well go work at right. McDonald's. You know, so well, what can point. you do to get ahead of either the short sale or REO curve in the marketplace you want to work at? And that's where, quite frankly, I didn't want to list massive amounts of REOs, but I wanted to sell them. And that's why I have investors like Tim and Julie, and I can name like 10 of them, who will buy in a heartbeat who's got cash lines. And so that's how I'm getting going to where the puck's going to be in the REO side. And I'm networking with the agents who are REO listing agents, and I'm out there going like, buyer A is ready for a deal in this zip code. Could you give me a call a day or two ahead of time before you get the listing so we can drive by? And, you know, this buyer is good in cash, and if it's priced right, he has no problem coming in near where you're asking and putting a deposit, and we'll close in three weeks. And it's a win for the buyer and me and you, and it's a win for your seller. So I'm proactively looking for listings for my investors who are out there. Joe, how do you stay on track? Do you have weekly minimum standards for yourself? No, I do not have any minimum. You know, uh, I used to do the old buy one, sell one, buy one, list one every day. If not, you know, double up tomorrow. Well, that's a little too brutal. Uh, I just stay on track by getting every day and making my calls and taking care of my business and, you know, trying to help as many people with their real estate needs as I can. I don't have minimum enough. Don't have minimum, you know, you can 
You can plan your work or work your plan, or you can just kind of work. And some days I just kind of work. Joe, do you ever have days where you don't feel like working? How do you how do you stay so motivated? Usually, I don't feel like working after six at night unless it's real important contract listing. Uh, I don't feel like working all weekend. So I'll I'll just kind of turn it off. Um, but you know, generally I like to work. You know, five and a half, six days. Yeah, I like to help people with their real estate needs. So when you're saying, like for example, a lot of people they they pursue this thing called balance, right? They pursue this balance in their. You know what it means. You've heard, I'm sure, mm-hmm. many many people talk about it. Is balance a myth? Well, you can't be perfectly balanced. I mean, you can't have tw- regularly 20% family, 20% spiritual, 20% financial, 20% business, 20% being in shape. You can't balance that because you're always going to get out of balance. But when you get out of balance, you've got to figure out, okay, why am I out of balance? Why am I doing 70% work and not much of anything else? What can I do to get a little bit into balance? But to be in perfect balance all the time is a myth. Don't know anybody right. with in perfect balance. Neither do I. And so if you had to be, for example, and this is something that a lot of uh, people, agents struggle with, is they think they're supposed to be in balance, and the quest to be in balance causes them stress. So the reason that they're being stressed and the reason they're feeling burned out is because they're trying to pursue a myth. Here's a little secret for you guys, and you can hear this anytime you talk with anybody successful, read any book about anybody successful, watch any movie about anybody successful. They are not in balance because when you're trying to say, for example, if you're trying to get yourself in peak condition, you're trying to get yourself to the uh, position where you can run in a triathlon or whatever it is that you're trying to accomplish, you are going to have to take time away from the other aspects of your life, including your family, including spiritual, including work. When you see somebody walk by you that's in perfect physical condition, condition they look like a supermodel man or man or woman chances are they've sacrificed in other aspects of their lives the same goes true when you hear about somebody who's been super successful in business chances are they have sacrificed in other parts of their lives but to them it wasn't a sacrifice they made the choice we interviewed marty rodriguez uh, a few weeks ago and she's the number one century 21 agent in the world and i asked her that very question And it was a very emotional answer that she gave us, as some of you will remember. And her point was, you know, that basically used to bother me, that I felt like I was taking too much time away from my family. And then she said when her daughter was young, her daughter basically thanked her for working as hard as she did because her mom, Marty, was able to provide her family with a lot of, you know, really great things, education, experiences, and comfort, and financial security, and, you know, all those types of things. So, guys, listen, balance is a wonderful thing to consider, and if you feel yourself out of balance, you need to obviously spend more time on whatever it is that you're feeling like you're lacking, go do it. But for gosh sakes, don't try to balance your life out so that it's equal this and equal that, like Joe said, because that will frustrate you. So, Joe, moving forward, right, we're in the middle of this, you know, I hear now this word being thrown around called the greater depression, right, this no longer the Great Recession, not the Great Depression. Now it's the Greater Depression. And there's and the simple statistical facts, and you're a broker owner of Keller Williams, and you know this, is the number of agents uh, that's in the business is consistently dropping. And we're, I read something yesterday, Joe, that said, you know, the number of agents is predicted by the end of next year to be right around early, uh, like, you know, 1994, 1995 levels, which is right around 750 to 850,000 agents. In other words, the total number of agents will drop by roughly half inside six or seven years. So in a market like this that is challenging, that does require skills, that does require a high level of commitment, right, what advice do you have or what, I don't know, what sage-type experience that can only come from someone that's been in the business since 1979 would you like to leave out there in the ether for all the agents listening now and in replay. Don't Joe dwell that Go. much on what's in the paper or what's on the TV. The only thing you truly control is what you let get between your ears. So if you live by absorbing 
negative and pessimistic thoughts, whether they're true or not, they'll really soak into your mind and get in your subconscious, and they'll just screw up your life in general. You you can control your first thought. You can't control your second thought. So just I'm on a call. Um, so we're going to go from there, and you just got to take care of your own mindset. Yeah, I mean, that's right. So you can't, control control. The first thought. you can't control that's the first thought that pops in your head, but you can influence the second thought and choose whether or not you're going to act on the first thought. And, and guys, Joe said it really well right there. He basically made the fact and made the point of it doesn't really matter what direction the market's going. It doesn't really matter, you know, and he said earlier, you can offset a slower market by having a lot more listings. You can offset a slower, you know, fewer buyers and tougher financing by learning about alternative ways to get people financing, being more aggressive on who you're going to list and, all, and price changes and all those types of things. Guys, it does not matter what direction the real estate market goes. There will always be people that have to sell and there will always be people that have to buy. So, Joe, if anyone wants to send you a referral, and, I, guys, I can't give Joe a better endorsement to say than Julie and I use them ourselves. I don't know how many houses we bought or sell through you, but quite a few. So, Joe, if uh, someone wants to send you business or buy an investment property through you, how might they get a hold of you? Okay, uh, direct line 614-431-1220. Email rjoe at kw.com uh, or thejacksonteam.net and send us that way, and we'll be glad to play a great referral fee for you or work with your investors um, and just help help people buy and sell properties. You know, we're in a people business. Real estate's our product. Uh, we'll be glad to assist anybody you know. So, Joe, listen, I really appreciate your time today. I know you're a very busy man. Everyone else who's listening, please listen to what Joe had to offer. He's very concrete, very level-headed Nothing fancy, nothing elaborate, no crazy schemes, no fancy website stuff. This is very bottom line, belly to belly, as he said, you know, really traditional way of selling real estate. It's about building a relationship with folks based on not just how much they like you, but by the experience and the confidence they have in you. You can all foster that, but it takes you having a commitment to knowing your market. It takes a commitment to you having the knowledge to be able to help people. You have to know how to do short sales. You have to know about the various things that are going to be affecting buyers' decisions. You have to know about different ways of, you know, obviously financing and different challenges that are happening in your individual markets. This is just part of the job. This is a minimum requirement. You have to be proactive, and people will seek you out for what you know and frankly, as Joe said, they'll seek you out because they know of you, of being someone who's competent, someone who's trustworthy, and someone who has the skill set. So Joe Jackson from Keller Williams in Columbus, Ohio, Keller Williams Capital Partners, if I remember correctly, I want to thank you for being today's Harris Real Estate University superstar. And guys, remember, if you have any referrals you want to send Joe's way, just contact him directly. And Joe, that phone number again is? Uh, 614-431-1220. So, Mr. Joe Jackson, thank you for being today's Harris Real Estate University superstar. And for the rest of you, have a fantastic weekend. And remember the little offer that I put out there at the top of the call. If you guys send us a nicely written testimonial, nothing just short and, you know, one line, a nicely written testimonial, we will send you our buyer prequalification script. Email your nicely written testimonial to Tim at HarrisRealEstateUniversity.com. And remember, include your name, your phone number, and your web address, and I will keep those links live on the blog. And our blog is the most visited of its sort on the Internet, and I will link back, and that will certainly help your, well, hypothetically will help your SEO placement within Google and the rest. So on behalf of uh, Julie, myself, and all the faculty and staff of Harris Real Estate University, I want to say, Julie, thank you for joining us for today's superstar interview. Joe, have a fantastic weekend, and I'll talk to you later. Excellent. Thank you all. Bye.